Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming out to the library. My name is Emily, and I'm on the events team here. And we are so uh, glad to welcome Francis Kaihua Wong uh, to the library again uh, to uh, discuss and listen to her new book, You Cannot Resist Me When My Hair Is in Braids. So uh, just a, a couple of announcements. Um, so you might have seen a sign in. Um, uh, on your on your way into the room um, and if you didn't sign up so just to let you know that is just a contact tracing thing so if we find out that somebody at this event was COVID positive we can let you know so that is optional but if you didn't fill it out that is really just for your protection um, so you could do that after the event um, also we have our friends at book suite who are selling copies of you cannot resist me when my hair is in braids um, so uh, you can go visit them um, we will be having a signing. Oh, that's right. We have to do a signing. Oh, nice. That's right. Okay. That, I'm mentally adjusting my timeline for okay. when the event needs to end. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, so we're going to have a signing uh, after the event. So you can just go grab a copy of the book. Um, and then we'll have a, a table here and, and, and Francis can sign books. Um, and so I just want to... I didn't even actually know how I can do a really proper introduction. And I know that I think you're going to talk a, a little bit about some projects that you're doing and about this book project. Um, and I say that because I feel like Francis Kaihua Wong is like a person who has so many irons in the fire, always, is always working on so many different projects. And it's like, oh, look, and I'm like, I don't even know what to prioritize to, <laughs> to tell people about, but she is an activist, a writer, um, a journalist, um, and an advocate for um, Asian American uh, issues, a longtime fierce advocate. So uh, welcome to the library, Francis. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, it, it's, I'm so excited to be here because, of course, I love the Ann Arbor District Library. <laughs> and uh, you know, my kids grew up here. I grew up here, really, uh, with the kids. Um, and we have spent a lot of time here, and, uh, and I'm just really excited to be here. So, are we starting? Shall we start? Okay, so let's, uh, let me read. Let me read a, a little piece, and then we will, um, so we'll, what we'll do today is we're going to read, I'll read a few pieces and, and tell you the stories that go with them, and then we'll have some conversation, and then we'll have Q&A, and then we'll have the book signing, and then the library closes at 8 o'clock, so we have to get to be out by then so but we're gonna have fun this will be great and thank you all for coming so this is from the prologue of the book um, Buddhists say that suffering comes from unsatisfied desire so for years I tried to close the door to desire any desire I was so successful I not only closed the door I locked it barred it nailed it shut then stacked a bunch of furniture in front of it it was the only way I could survive the long loneliness that was my marriage. I was dead to desire, going through only the motions of life. I did not even dare read novels, write poetry, or watch bad romantic comedies for fear of what small hope they might inspire. And now that door is open, wide open, and all my insides are spilling out. And you, not knowing this dangerous detail, tease me. Dare me to live again. The more I warn you away, the closer you draw toward me. I fear you will catch fire, that I will consume you, that I won't be able to stop. A friend remarks about my former car and former life. I saw a Land Rover broken down on the side of Highway 23 and thought of you. So glad that ain't me anymore. Strut and unfurl, you tell me, and courage comes. So that, you know, in the in the in the tradition of, of poetry readings, if there's something you like, feel free to snap your fingers like when it happens. You know, I can't snap my fingers. I'm like a dud at poetry readings. I go to poetry <laughs> readings all the time and I cannot snap my fingers. I've never been able to learn my whole life. I've thought about maybe I should put a recording on my phone and then <laughs> do it digitally, but that's so lame. Um, but feel free. <laughs> I know it's awkward when you don't know when the poem actually ends. Um, 
But I wanted to take you, this, this book in many ways, is, and also my other chapbooks, in many ways are, are kind of a, a love letter to Ann Arbor and uh, my friends and my life here, um, except for the sad parts. <laughs> but that's all, it's all related. Let's see, I was going to do 32. Ah, okay, so this is a, a piece called Poignant Truth Precarious You. And, and a lot of my pieces are really long, and so I'm going to be reading sections of them. But let me, let me show you a little picture first. Am I doing this right? Oh, there we go. These are some of my other book projects, uh, other book projects, uh, upcoming talks if you're interested. But uh, I wanted to skip ahead. This is my childhood. Um, but that's me and my parents. Uh, when they first, the immigrants, when they first came to America, and then some more childhood pictures. I think that's kindergarten, or that's probably kindergarten in uh, Disneyland. My mom, when she went to USC, my mom used to like leave me in the sandbox outside of USC, which is in Watts, to babysit my brother in the sandbox while she went to class, evening classes. Um, <laughs> terrifying, but uh, anyways, okay, so we'll go back to here. That was my childhood. So I grew up in L.A. Um, uh, or when, my, when I was little, I was in L.A. And so this is uh, often happened. <laughs> a moment. My parents wake me in the middle of the night. Chilai, chilai, hurry. Only enough time to grab my favorite doll, and I have been bundled, bleary-eyed into the car, and we are driving through the three tunnels that mark the way, then burst into the light and cacophony that is old LA Chinatown at midnight. We always, come in, we always come in the back door, through the kitchen, past the uncles with their giant woks and oil. Tsa! Our eyes adjust to the darkness of the restaurant, and then aunties, uncles, little friends, xiao ye time. That means oa, xiao long bao, zhu er, hong you chao shou, zhou, but first we order shang pian cha, which I always thought was champagne tea, which makes sense. These days, teenage girls gather around my kitchen table and I ply them with mango mochi and shang pian cha, pretending not to eavesdrop as they celebrate college admissions. I got into MIT! Gasp over who is sending whom naked Snapchats. Ew! And cry over. My mom says I'm not allowed to date those steezy, third-generation, snapback-wearing California Asian boys with the expensive shoes. So that's, so, that's, so that's part of Poignant Truth, Precarious You. Oh, and Preparing for the Sri Racha Apocalypse. That's the full title of that one. Uh, and, and a lot of these pieces have, have um, I want to say, echoes in, in current events. And this one, I don't... It, this was big news in Asian America. There was a Sri Racha factory that um, had, was in a fight with the city council or something. And so they stopped production for several months and people were worried and that maybe it wouldn't get resolved. People were stockpiling Sri Racha, uh, us included. We bought cases and cases of it. And, um, but it worked out all right. They're back in business. Um, okay. And then one more, Wang Da Zhong. So this is um, your time is good. Okay, so this is Wang Da Zhong. If in Chinese, um, this is the standard Chinese textbook. This is actually not the one that I use. This is probably from the '90s. It's very you can tell they're very modern looking. These kids are like very casual. The the generation of these books that I had, they're in uniforms. They're very you know straight backed and all this, but. Um, when you start writing, learning to write Chinese, you, you write with very simple characters. So um, Wang Da Zhong is a name, but the characters you can tell are very simple. There's only a few strokes for each one. And so, you know, chapter one of your Chinese textbook is going to be, you know, the, the characters will all have very simple names. And so this is uh, a character that was in, that was the star, basically, of all my Chinese textbooks. And then my kids, then I grew up and my kids went to Chinese school and he was the star of my kids' Chinese textbooks. And then what happens is, you know, once you know, like, how do I say this? Um, I was a bad Chinese school student. 
And so um, sometimes I would cut corners and I would use words that I knew. So like in college, I had an exam. I had to write Mao Zedong. I couldn't remember how to write it. So I said, Mr. Mao, because I knew those words. Teacher saw right through it. I got in big trouble. But <laughs> anyways, Wanda, this is why Wanda Zhong shows up in so many um, bad Chinese school students' essays like me. So whatever happened to Wang Da Zhong? Whatever happened to Wang Da Zhong? We meet in, Chinese, in San Jose on the first day of Saturday morning Chinese school on the pages of book one, chapter one of the same textbook they use in Taiwan. Instead of see dick, see dick, run, run, dick, run, we walk to school with Wang Da Zhong. This is my book bag. This is my pen. This is my chair. We all rise and bow to the teacher together as she enters our classroom. Good morning, teacher. Good morning, students. Are you Wang Da Zhong? Yes, I am Wang Da Zhong. My parents were born in China, grew up in Taiwan, then came to America for graduate school, like so many of that generation. Pushed by war, pulled by education and opportunity, made a life among silicon chips and prune orchards. But none of us are Taiwanese, really. We are Wai Ren from the outer provinces. Outsiders there, outsiders here. I've only been to Taiwan twice, once when I was three and once when I was 19. I ate fresh Xiaobing Yo Tiao, hot out of the oil and dipped in fresh Doujiang early in the morning mist. I watched the Taichung University talent show where a cute boy with a guitar sang about the boxer and the come-ons from the horse on 7th Avenue. My new friends laughed when I mixed up new vocabulary words, Anquan Mao and Bao Xian Tao, Tong Wu and Tong Xing. I like to say we are Chinese by way of Taiwan. And the nice white ladies at school say, oh, I love Thailand. So it's Wang Da Zhong. OK, and then one more, and then I'll, we'll, we'll pass it to you so you can start picking the pieces. I wanted to do one that was um, uh, uh, John Hilton at the Ann Arbor Observer. He got a, a copy of this, and he immediately spotted this location in town and, uh, and said, I know where this is. <laughs> and so it's, it, this one, it's, it's called Adventures with the Haircut Antis, and it's actually in this month's Ann Arbor Observer. So if you want to go, you can take a closer look at that one. But, uh, but as, as John Hilton writes at the bottom, you know, all of these are, you know, it's, it's their lyric essay, prose poetry. They're kind of right in the, in the what do you call it, in, in the intersections of of creative nonfiction and poetry. And so we're trying to be creative here. So Adventures with the Haircut Antis. On our way to see the Haircut Antis, a week before Chinese New Year's, we run into our little friend, Miss Hu, who the kids say should go to medical school so that she can become Dr. Hu. We take a picture together. That took a minute. Um, we take a picture together and tell her to come with us to see the haircut aunties just a block away. She laughs and shakes her short hair. No thanks, I already got my lecture this year. A week before Chinese New Year, we all pour into the little shop with a hot pink awning to see the haircut aunties. To me, they ask, are you going to New York to see your boyfriend or to catch a new boyfriend? They lecture me on how I need to dress up better and spend more time doing my hair in the morning and please put on some makeup for once. They blow out my hair so big and glamorous, I do not recognize myself. A week before Chinese New Year's, the haircut aunties tell my daughters to find a nice Chinese boyfriend with a good job, preferably an engineer. Look for the nerdy boy who works hard and makes lots of money. Not the shiny boy who knows how to talk all romantic. Shiny boy is okay for boyfriend, but not for Mary. Don't be like your mom. <laughs> so, thank you. And, uh, and we have lots more, and I've got lots more pictures too. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm. I turned my microphone off. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, with so many of these pieces, you know, we were talking, um, before uh, the start of the program, um, right? There are so many um, angles that you could look at this book from. There are so many threads that you can pull out. You know, the the pieces are all of different lengths. They're all um, they're all just like written in these these different lyrical voices, um, and you know, I, I was just sort of like hunting for like, okay, like what are the themes that are are coming up over and over again? Like what are what are these big overarching themes that I see in this book? Because I know like, you know, reading the acknowledgments and also looking at these chat books that this this book is quite long in the making. Um, and it's and the pieces are pulled from from many different types of publications. So um one of the 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 questions are the one of the the things that that came up to me is um, this book is uh, I mean the word fierce definitely comes to mind. This book is um, you know the the way that you are refusing to be misunderstood after many years of living in a culture that willfully misunderstands you is is the way that I'm um, coming, the impression that I'm coming uh, away from this book with. And so, um, m- you know, one of my favorite pieces, which is the least appropriate piece, which is, it's not a yellow dildo, <laughs> um, but for me, it just like, it crystallizes so much of the book because there's the humor in there, but there's also like the the really hard things about family and about um, betrayal and about someone who is part of a dominant culture trying to hold you, um, trying to make you bend to their will. Um, So I would just love if you could just like read a couple of passages from this story um, and, and talk about sort of for you. Thank you. I was like, I was picturing them. I was picturing them, um, but I'm glad to to finally get get an actual picture. Um, and yeah, and just and just talk about how for you, um, you you see this piece fitting into the rest of the book. Yeah, this this piece it took me a long time to write. It it uh, it really was the hardest one to write, and uh, and it but it started. You know, if we're talking about Ann Arbor, like I said, this is all fiction. If anyone wants, you know, these are all <laughs> fiction, prose poetry, uh, but but it's inspired by uh, U of M Children's, a, a space in children. I should not say this is not inspired by U of M Children's Center, but this first scene that I'm going to read to you, <laughs> it takes place at U of M Children's Center. Um, and because uh, you know how when you get bananas and you put them in your lunch, they always turn brown, right? It's horrible. But the Japanese have this amazing thing, right? And and it really works. They're amazing. And and actually, when I first wrote this, I had this great idea like I would buy like cases of these and give them out as prizes. And then when the book finally came out, I forgot. And oh then gosh, I went, I looked for like, them. I know. Be, like, throwing these into the audience know, right They don't now. make this. I know. This is, I have to go find them. They um they don't actually don't make this kind anymore. This is the best kind. I've looked at a lot of them. This is the best kind. But I will continue looking. So the next time I come, we'll have this. Um, you know, these these couple years of COVID, my brain is working very slowly. So, but this is uh, we're just going to pull one section out of the middle. I first encounter a banana case Tupperware in the lunchbox of a three-year-old Japanese-American boy in Little Brother's preschool. Curved yellow plastic to keep the banana from bruising, round air holes to prevent overripening, and cheerful lettering in Japanese and English spelling out banana case. This is brilliant. Best thing ever invented. Just what I need to keep little brother's favorite fruit from turning into a puddle of brown mush in his lunchbox, but not available in the US. I try to mimic the design by poking holes in various size Tupperware and bento boxes, patting the square corners and round hollows with napkins, not closing the lid all the way, but nothing works. 
I beg every Japanese family I know to please bring me a banana case back from Japan. No luck. Years pass. Then, at the Banana 2 Asian American Bloggers Conference, Bicoastal Bitchin hosts a party at the Far Bar to launch their new website celebrating Asian American sexuality, yellowdildo.com. They give away plastic banana cases along uh, as swag with their URL, yellowdildo.com, wrapped around the middle. I forget my conference cool instantly with my big hair and foul mouth and revert back to my true identity as somebody's mom. Oh, a banana Tupperware. I've been looking for one of these for years. Little brother does not understand why his teenage sisters scream when they find the swag in my suitcase or why they all suddenly beg to have bananas for lunch at Huron High School. But luckily, we managed to convince him, since he can't read yet, that the URL says yellowduck.com. A few days later, little brother figures out that it can't really say yellowduck.com the way the, his sisters are going on about the bad word on it. He whispers to me that he has finally figured out that, it, that really it must say yellowdumb.com. He knows that this very bad word is not allowed in our house, so he mouths it silently. Yes, very bad word. Yes, sweetheart, don't say that word. <laughs> and then it goes on this wild story. Um, I don't know how much you want to get into the rest of the story. You'll just have to read it. Um, I guess I, do you want me to read a little more? But when it, I don't think it's that good enough. Well, I guess, so thinking about, I, I'm glad that you, that Pat, and it is, <laughs> but I think one of the things, so later, oh, this very microphone. tale, um, you know, later. Emily, your microphone. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. He um, was waving wildly. <laughs> So later in the story, um, you are being challenged by a fictional ex-husband <laughs> and some fictional uh, school counselors um, for having a, uh, a dildo in, in your home and, and in your children's lunch boxes, right? And it's clear yeah. to anyone who sees something like this, Really, if, if that's what you're seeing, that's on you. Um, it's, right? Like, it is what it is. Like, it's clear that that's what it is. Um, but I think there, like, so what I really love about this book is the way that you are reclaiming desire. And in the face of other people's discomfort with that desire. Um, and I think that... You know, this this person saying, I'm going to, like, call social services on you because you're putting dildos in, in this child's lunchbox, right? Like, there's this deep discomfort with desire. So, um, yeah, I just, I, you know, I don't know if you want to talk more about that, but I just, I really love this book as just, like, this reclamation of being like, I am a person who inhabits this place in our society, um, and I'm usually not allowed to have desires by, by mainstream standards, but in fact, this book is all about my desires. <laughs> I'm not sure what to say. <laughs> um, but yeah, so after I went to that conference and um, I brought all the swag home, I just, you know, when you come back from a conference, right, you get all this stuff. So I just kind of emptied out my suitcase and it's all over the, the, the you know, the kitchen table, the living room floor, it's everywhere. And uh, someone came into our house and took pictures of all our rooms and sent them to a psychologist. Um, and then I got phone calls from other psychologists, like, what is this I hear about you having a yellow dildo on your kitchen table? I'm like, it's not a yellow dildo, it's a Tupperware. And uh, anyways, it goes on and on, but uh, it's kind of a fun story. And then, oh, and then, um, yeah. No, that's good. <laughs> you have to buy the book. 
She's not going to give too much away, yeah. folks. Yeah. But Don't yeah, I'm trying secrets. to think what else. But yeah, but although in, in real life, one of the psychologists that inspired this story um, just lost their license, happened to report years later. I was very excited. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I. Um, and we also talked about uh, Tsundere Pride. Oh, Pride. Um, yes. And so I think actually this is um, a good segue uh, from that story and this, this question of, of desire and uncomfortable desire. Mm. Um, so if there are some uh, passages that you want to um, pick out of this piece. Okay. Oh, this is good. Oh, this is this is so Ann Arbor. You guys will recognize this place. So this this um, wrong way. So this um, piece, Tsundere Prada, You Are So Prickly, was inspired by the artwork of Stella Zhang. I was asked to write a poem for the Asian American Women's Artists Association in San Francisco, and they had the artwork already picked out, and we were supposed to look at the artwork and um, write something inspired by that. And so she had these like great. They're like they're like big homemade pillows stuffed with toothpicks. I mean, I don't think they really are toothpicks, but you know, my unartist eye, it looked like these big, you know, soft balls, but stuck with toothpicks. And there, it's here, a whole bunch of them. This isn't the original picture from the artwork. I couldn't find it quick enough. But um, <laughs> so I wrote this poem and I performed it at the art exhibition. And afterwards, she was like stunned into silence, the artist. And she's like, I have never thought about my work like that before, which was great. It was fun. And, uh, and the first line of this piece is, oh, you are so prickly. And, uh, but I will skip ahead <laughs> to, the, to the, the part Emily wanted um, or liked. When I met the third great love of my life, I was totally open to his words of hope and possibility. I was innocent, naive, trusting. At the same time, I, oh no, at the time, I did not know how to be otherwise. I waited for the usual signs, the hey China doll and konnichiwa baby. When they didn't come, I let myself fall in love on a Sunday afternoon in the sunshine while walking past the dinosaur museum. And then he was gone. So I began to protect myself, to act tougher than I was, to retreat into myself. Overnight, I sprouted spikes across my shoulders and down my sides, and I hid them by turning them inward onto myself, and I hated the person I became. Loud, phony, posturing, tough, tsundere. The next few fellows had no chance. By the time I met you, by the time I met you, the banter was rehearsed, the defenses were strong. I had no interest, but you were persistent. Teenage girls gather around my kitchen table making mochi and crying over boys. I hear the same useless advice that my girlfriends give to me. Boys are dumb, let him go. One teenager draws me a diagram in the scattered mochiko to explain the seriousness of the situation. A loves B, who loves C, who is going out with D, who cheated on E in seventh grade, whatever that means, who made a pass at F, who got herpes from G, who is not allowed to date but likes H, who might be gay and has a crush on J, who held hands with K, who is chatting with L on Facebook, who follows M on Tumblr, who keeps texting A at midnight. When one girl exclaims, I wish they would just all go to Antarctica, Another one answers, that's chill. And, uh, and then another section from this. Uh, so uh, let me think. Let me read it first. Uh, I was so naive when I first came to the Midwest. I was so slow to learn what it was like to be a minority. I did not understand how the lens of stereotype functions. Once, when facing down a big Main Street lawyer who could not see me, could not hear me, could not comprehend the very complicated difference between Chinese New Year and Lunar New Year, 
I realized his confusion came from me, not fitting expectations. I tried to explain, standing up tall in my suit, piling on words and more words, big words, eloquent words, but without an accent, he just could not understand me. I finally had to let go of who I am in my world, in angry Asian America, and become small, delicate, porcelain, quiet, the exotic oriental China doll he could understand. I retracted my spikes into myself, ouch, pretended to be someone I was not, and for a moment saved myself. Then I think about the questions being asked about the two brothers in Boston after the marathon. At first, everyone was asking, what happened to these two boys and their experience of the American dream? Boys? 19 and 26 years old and still boys? Ah, that was back when they were still white. Troubled Sung Hui Cho and 23 and immature Darun Ravi, 18, were never described as boys. The brothers are initially described by friends as sweethearts, nice, good athletes. People joke about brofiling until they discover that oh, there are Muslims in Chechnya. Never mind that Chechnya is exactly in the middle of the Caucasus. Suddenly, they become brown. Imagine that happening every day of their lives. A grandfather gives his granddaughter dating advice. Those bombers look nice. So be careful with nice looking boys because they could turn out to be terrorists. This country is hard on outsiders. I wonder if it was hard on you. And so, and this story actually was in the news about a month ago. Um, and I was, I was working and it, it came up on my screen and I was like, I had to work. And I'm th all I could think about was was this passage that I had written and how I'd reacted when the case first came up. And I was like, you know, I finished the piece, but I was pretty much a wreck for the rest of the day. And I waited till five o'clock and I'm like, okay, they can't be mad at me now. And I took a picture of it and I sent it to my editor. And I'm like, I wrote this a long time ago. And she's like, she was in tears. Yeah, so. So I, I think I'm going to ask one more question that I yeah. think we should take some audience questions. But um, listening to you read this piece, um, the question that came to me was, were, um, how were you thinking about yourself in relation to other people as, as you're writing um, this piece, which is pushing back against stereotypes um, complicating questions of identity do you feel that when you're writing that yes you're you're writing for your own experience but but also do you feel that you are writing so that other people um can um can also be freer to talk about their own experience as well yeah i think so because, um, you know, so, so I'm one of these people that I don't know what I think until I write it down. So if something weird happens in the world, I'll go home and I'll write it and, and figure out what exactly happens and what did it mean. And, you know, if this were a novel, what would be the, you know, what would the, you know, whatever, right? The symbolism of the weird thing that happened. And, you know, I go a little overboard sometimes, but, but I like to do that. And then... So first I'll write and just get, get my head on straight and figure out what happened. And then if I'm going to try to publish it, I'll make sure that keep other people can understand it as well. And, and then I'll add in the, the details. So for example, like that piece, I, you know, I added in the bombers, you know, the two brothers in Boston after the marathon, right? I had to add that in so you would know. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about when actually when I first wrote this it was very close in time to the Boston bombing so I didn't have to say that but by the time the book came out it had been quite a long time so I needed to add that in and um, and so I add those in and so yeah I hope yeah because I want I, um, and then and I think for for when I write there there's two levels of things there's one level for Asian Americans that I think we'll we'll see and we'll get it. And I think I notice it when you get like individual laughs of people going, ah, you know. 
um, like Hey China Dell and Konnichiwa Baby, like every Asian American woman has gotten that at some point. Um, and then, and then, uh, but then I'd also, you know, but it shouldn't just be for Asian Americans, right? It's for other folks as well. And, and, and actually a lot of people have, you don't have to be Asian American to have these sort of similar experiences and to understand these experiences. So, you know, um, I answering your question. So yes. I, I think, I think, uh, yeah. So, and then, then I also do incorporate a lot of like current events in it as well with kind of like my take on it. Cause for publication, like, you know, in journalism world, I can't always have my emotional reaction to things, but we're all people. We do emotionally react to some of the stories that we do. And as, as, and journalists have to deal with really hard stories. Sometimes I had, I overheard, not overheard, I was um, listening to a conversation once between these journalists about PTSD from covering wars and, you know, how they had to get help and how do you, you know, how do you do that? How do you take care of yourself? And it was like such a interesting conversation. I was like, oh, I should think about that maybe sometime. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Okay, well, uh, first of all, a little preliminary round of, uh, of applause thanks. for the reading. Thank you. Um, so I'm actually just going to um, run around with the mic here. So we've got time for a couple of questions, I think. So if anybody has a question, um, you can just raise your hand and I'll come over with the mic. Otherwise, I could keep reading. Oh, there we go. Hi, Francis. I'm Stacy. Um, so I work at the university at Michigan Medicine, and I do a bit of AAPI con community building. And, you know, I think that you hit on this in your book about all of the violence that happened in the Asian American and Asian communities and how that affected so many people. Um, but something that is a recurring theme in the conversations that I have with students, with faculty, with staff, um, with my friends, is that they're experiencing <clears throat> something that's really interesting because you live life as maybe a first generation American, uh, Asian American, and you go through life kind of hating yourself, right? Um, you are denied your identity, you are sort of gaslit, um, and you are constantly questioning yourself. And what I see happening um, around my community is that people are transforming in a way where they are sort of going through an awakening and re-embracing their identity as Asians and really digging into their roots, those traditions and those cultural markers that um, make them feel at home or remind them of a culture, a family, a past that they had long denied themselves. And I'm wondering if this is something that you went through and if this book was part of that process, perhaps of an awakening or a sort of conversation with yourself um, and um, maybe a reflection of what was happening around your community too. Yeah, that's a great question, a hard question. Um, I, I was born and, and grew up in California, and I came to Michigan for graduate school, and 22 years old, straight out of college, and I had the hardest time in grad school. I dropped out ABD um, because I'd never really had the experience of being a minority before. Like, in my experience, like, when you're a kid, in school, you might get bullied on the playground, but then after fourth grade, everyone grows up and, you know, that's it. And then I came to Michigan and then it was happening all over again, like from adults. And I'm like, oh, well, these people didn't outgrow it. That's really strange. And I had to kind of like under, you know, come to terms with that. And then I never really planned to stay very long. And then, you know, life happened. And then I ended, I met a cute boy and uh, that happens a lot in my stories. And then I met a cute boy. And then, um, but when I, when we decided, uh, when he decided to stay in Michigan forever, um, 
you know, we, uh, we had kids. I had girl, you know, Asian American daughters. And I was like, well, I don't want them to grow up having identity issues. I don't want them to, you know, feel like a minority. Um, they shouldn't have to kind of have the same growing pains that I went through. Like, we should be further ahead by now. And so I was writing for an Asian American magazine at the time, and I wrote a lot of, you know, about raising strong and confident Asian American girls and a lot of that and raising bilingual and trilingual kids. And, uh, uh, you know, for years I wrote that, like, and <laughs> none of it exists anymore because the magazine went under. It was all digital. It's all gone. Uh, someday I'll put it into a book. But, um, but while I was doing this, I was doing a lot of research. I was doing a lot of writing, but I was also building community. And so I was looking for folks to kind of bring in so that my kids were actually really very sheltered when they were little because I built this community around them. So they didn't know that they, because everyone around them was Asian American of some sort or a person of color of some sort or just cool people, right? Or professors. I actually have a lot of professor friends. So smart people like, you know, like my daughter knew the word hegemony when she was in kindergarten. And, uh, you know, it's very Ann Arbor, right? <laughs> so, um, so they didn't know they were minorities. They took it for granted that everyone was bilingual. Like they would meet kids at the park and say, well, what languages do you speak? Like, and, and uh, you know, later on as they grew older, little things would happen. I was like, oh, I forgot to teach them about, you know, Christianity. Okay, here's a, here's a crash course. This is what you need to know to not offend people when you're out in the world. And then that was like six years old, I think. And then, um, um, but anyways, but I think, you, you know, I, I worked very hard to create this community and to raise them strong and confident. And boy, we used to joke like, oh yeah, they have self-esteem. You know, I did all this so they wouldn't have self-esteem problems, but they ended up having too much self-esteem, <laughs> more problems. But uh, anyway, so that's kind of, that's, that's um, kind of with my early writing, uh, this What's in this book and these books are more, I want to say more past the parenting stage, right? And then as an adult, like starting to date again, like that's weird, you know, <laughs> after you like, like, you know, learning how to, like when you have little kids, right? You, 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 you fall into habits. You don't say bad words and, you know, you tend to only talk to moms at PTOs and only you only have friends who are moms. And, and then suddenly you have to date, like, wait, how does that even work, right? And so that's what in these books, then I, I'm trying to figure out that part. And, uh, but it's different in later in life. Like when you're 20, you don't even know who you are, really. You think you do, but you don't. And, uh, but... They, there's kind of a, a stereotype with a, with Chinese women um, at 40, like suddenly there's this big transformation. And whatever stereotype there might have been when, you know, Asian women were young and nice and quiet, the daughter stereotype suddenly changes, transforms into the mom or the auntie stereotype. And you don't mess with them, right, at all. And sometimes I would see this at, at Chinese school, you know, and my friends, like, oh, yeah, she's the one. Actually, the kids would have a, um, comp not competition, vote. They would vote in middle school, like, who had the meanest Chinese school mom? And uh, that was not me. Uh, I'll tell you later who it was. But uh, <laughs> she knows. But, uh, yeah. Great. Do we have uh, any other questions? Hi, Ms. Francis. Um, my name is Jada Dane. I was uh, previously a student here at the University of Michigan. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for sharing this part of you with the world. Um, I'm not a part of the uh, Asian American community, obviously. Um, with that being said, I'm curious as to what your goals were for the takeaway for those that are not a part of that community. Um, was it more of like a look at the inside, like seeing the experience? Because I, I understand that, um, you know, you get those comments of, oh, I have a friend or, 
oh, I've read this or I've seen this experience. Like, I understand what you're going through. Like, obviously not. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious as to um, what, like, how you wanted uh, your message to be perceived for those that do not personally experience that for themselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great question. I never thought about that. I would say build community and learn about other communities. Um, there's, um, I want to say, it's not quite a joke, but people always say, like, you know, if you have questions about, you know, my culture, don't ask me. Go read a book, right? And, and on Twitter, a lot of times people say, you know, here are a list of 10 books that you can read to learn about, you know, say, say you know, whatever culture. Um, don't go bother your one black friend, right? Or something like that. Your one Asian friend. Don't, you know, just give them some space. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so, you know, I, I read a lot, right? I've read a lot, and, and I have, like, you know, I would say my community isn't necessarily just Asian Americans. Like, the people I'm, I, I listen to, that I read and listen to, is really all communities of, you know, a lot of communities of color, uh, people who are, I'm going to say, minorities in different ways, you know? So... I, I try to learn. There's some communities I'm not very good at, and so or that's what my kids tell me. They like, <laughs> should I say this? Um, you know. So, anyway, so when my kids say, "You're," it doesn't make sense. You just don't know anything about this one topic or this one community. You know so much about everybody else. How come you don't know anything about this? And I'm like, "Oh, well, okay, I'll go find out." And so I go and I read, and I defer to my friends who know better until I kind of get my footing. and um, But I wouldn't presume to speak for that community. But in terms of finding community and finding solidarity, I think we're all stronger together than apart. And so we, the goal is not definitely not that people should be siloed into their own little communities. In a way, I think sometimes you need to kind of be around people who are you know, exactly like you so that you can build up your strength. But then once you're strong, then you can step out and do the next, you know, I would say the next layer of people a little bit different and the next layer, a little bit different, a little bit layer. And if it's kind of, you know, a lifelong project, by the end, you'll be friends with everybody, right? Maybe it's a little Pollyanna-ish, but, um, <laughs> but I do have, there's a lot of, um, I have this piece that Emily wanted me to read, actually. Was it the, the driving Yeah, the, and I was talking about this too. I'm doing a, a talk later in the month. And I mentioned this, and they're like, oh, no, because it, it mentions um, Trayvon Martin and George Floyd. And they're like, oh, no, you can't read this. You cannot read this because the black community at our company will be mad. And they, they, only they can talk about these issues. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm sure you've misunderstood them. But, uh, but uh, you know, people are afraid. Um, but, but I think if you, if you, but I think there's always more to learn, right? Um, I'm trying to think, where should I read this for? Okay, do you want me to read, read this one? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I liked the, you know, the, the kind of end of it, but there are, there are lots of great passages throughout. Yeah. Uh, I'll do this part about the... The night before George, this is called learning to drive defensively. And this, I have a, a boy, I, when he turned 16, I taught him how to drive. Uh, and that was, of course, the, the summer after, you know, this, I think it was the summer. Anyways, it was, it was terrifying for many reasons. Um, ba, 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 ba. Let's start here. The night before George Zimmerman is acquitted for, shooting the for the shooting death of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, Little brother is nine years old, tall for his age and beautifully brown from swimming under the summer sun. The aunties all coo over him, xiao shuai ge, and he blushes with embarrassment as they heap another serving on his plate. The night after George Zimmerman is acquitted for the shooting death of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, I teach my sweet, naive, multiracial nine-year-old baby boy how to take off his hoodie, slow down his movements, keep his hands visible, steady his voice, and make himself small in front of police and strange white men with guns. The lessons about strange white women will come later. 
Little brother tells me about his friend, Officer Gold, the African-American police officer who comes to his school to read colorful storybooks about spotted police dogs. And now I have taught him how to hide everything that is good and pure about himself. Um, and I'll skip ahead. Today, little brother is 16 years old, six feet tall, a mop of quarantine, have hashtag quarantine hair and learning to drive. As he jokes that he is a master driver, I tell him that driving takes a lot of trust. You trust that other drivers will stay on their side of the road. You trust that drivers will stop at the stop sign. You trust that other drivers will follow right of way. Thank goodness we believe in science and do not have to worry about gravity. We talk about what to do if he gets pulled over by the police. You learn to drive defensively because you do not really know the others, yet you trust. Uncle Chen gives little brother an old beater car, a 16-year-old boy's dream, and after months of quarantine, he is ready, ready to set forth into the world. But with COVID-19-inspired anti-Asian American violence, anti-black and brownness, police brutality, angry white men with AR-15s, and coronavirus too, I sort of like quarantine. I can teach little brother about the Vincent Chin case and hashtag stop AAPI hate and hashtag Black Lives Matter and hashtag Asians for Black Lives, but I am not ready, not ready to trust the world. Okay, I think we've got Thanks. time for one more question. I have a background in teaching, so I can definitely wait a long okay. time. Okay. But do you want the sewing aunties? Oh, oh here we go. Um, so I guess mine, my question would be to you. I think in writing um, things like this, you have to find yourself extremely vulnerable. And was there one that was, that was, you questioned if you wanted to be that vulnerable? Or is there one that was most difficult to be vulnerable? I guess maybe I should have asked it that way. Yeah. Um, you know, I, <laughs> that, I mean, that's actually a tension in the, in the writing. Because I tell people everything. Like, if you know me, don't ever tell me any secrets because I cannot say, keep secrets to save my life. And, and so I fell head over heels. I have this secret crush. What do I do? I write about it and I publish it in an international poetry magazine. Um, I don't know if you ever found out or not, but my girlfriends are all like, oh, we know who this is. Is this this person? Is it this person? You know, they're all guessing. They all want to know. But um, yeah, so I, I'm the sort of person who has a secret crush and publishes it. Uh, there are some things that, you know, need, need some time. I think that was one of the lessons I learned early in writing is like, you don't need to publish right away. Sometimes pieces need to sit for a little while. But um, there's this part, where was it? Emily was talking about how she liked it. Um, what is... Public is not. That's in the secret crush. Oh, is that in secret I think crush? It is. It's like, what is public? Oh, here it is. What is public? Oh, here it is. I'll just. Uh, oh, this is funny. Okay. Our paths cross every few years, and I squeal and minor fangirl every time. I tell my students and my children about him, teach his books, tell his stories. The perfect man exists, and knowing that is enough. If there exists one, there must exist another. What is public is not real. What is real is not public. Um, my mother puts out a call to all my older cousins to set me up with one of their friends before my birthday comes, and it is too late. My mother tells my cousins that money doesn't matter, education doesn't matter, race doesn't matter, breathing is enough. And uh, But in the whole piece, it's... Uh, where is it? Oh, here it is. As we talk through one of my, oh, and then in some mangled air traffic delay, our paths cross again in a crazy long layover at an airport. Both of us in the wrong city, both of us just passing through, both of us in a bubble. With nothing else to do, we talk, just talk, talk for hours, talk for days, and he is even more perfect than I knew. 
and I'm happy, just happy, happy for weeks. My neighbor sees it in my face right away, remarks on how the glow lingers. As we talk through one of my poems, I realize that it is not just that he is tall and handsome and smart, although that's a big part of it. It is an identity thing, more than conversation, more than intellectual compatibility, more than language, more than physical attraction, although there's a lot of that too. But in getting to know him, I get to know myself. In understanding him, I understand myself. In wanting him, I want myself. And, uh, and it goes on. And then it, it ends with uh, about why it, it cannot be, right? Of course, everything, all my secret crushes are doomed. But it ends up with, so instead of following up, I am writing. And that is enough. It has to be enough she says publicly in a poem. So. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Hey, oh, um, wow, our time is so fast. Yeah, yeah, we're... Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we wanted to end... Are we, are we ending now? Yeah. So, so. A, a lot of, uh, Emily was, was, as Emily was reading this, she said, you know, there's a lot of themes and there's a lot of places. And then she said, you know, Sweetwater shows up an awful lot. I'm like, well, <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> so I love Sweetwater's Cafe, my home away from home for, for many years. And uh, this, this uh, story uh, is set in Sweetwaters at downtown, you know, with the tall tables and those big windows on, on Ashley. Actually, I was there last week. They changed Ashley. It's a two-way street now. I was like, what? so, <laughs> you didn't know either. The pandemic, who knew? But I was sitting there. It was so distracting having cars come at me the wrong direction after having sat there for years. Cars only going one way. But anyways, um, as my kids like to say, I don't like change. I'm distressed. <laughs> but, uh, but this is a fun piece. Uh, and it's the, the title piece here. So, Sitting in Sweetwater's Cafe for the afternoon with a pot of Earl Grey tea, trying to write, trying to put off looking for a day job, trying to figure out how to construct a new beginning out of all of this financial ruin, all the while watching the cute boys walk past my window on this cold gray day, wishing for some handsome young professor to walk in and flirt with me for a bit. I've got my hair in braids today. You cannot resist me when my hair is in braids. So thank you all for coming. I have, um, hold on, I have, oh, this is one, let me just show you real quick. I have a piece, it's called Sewing Aunties. That was for an art exhibition. So it comes with all these, little art installations that I've made uh, inspired by recycling and my hoarder aunt and my hoarder house. Um, but these are the pictures that are, they're in the book, but in black and white. So these are the uh, color pictures. Um, and then the dreams of the diaspora is the first piece. And this is, these are the pictures that go with it. I was gonna read it to you, but sorry, we ran out of time. But I did want to say that the Washtenaw Reads, they're looking for titles. And I don't know if it's a competition or not. But if you want, all you have to do is just Google, suggest a title for Washtenaw Reads. It's a really simple form. It has like three things to fill in. Recommend my book, because I think this will be great for the Washtenaw Reads. <laughs> and then uh, thank you, Ann Arbor Library, Book Suite, and Wayne State Press. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>